So my name is Eleanor Musk, you know me, and I'm going to kind of extend on what the speakers have been speaking about first, which is looking at what we as lecturers, what we as guides on the side, are actually helping our students to become. I work out in dental hospital, and uh, as you probably know, dentistry has been around for centuries since Noah was a boy, and it has been always practiced as an art, and people that were engaged in giving dental care, they were called many names along the way, be it for example, the actual term <laughs> individual that was drawing teeth, or a dentist, or even dentator, etc., and other names that you probably have called your dentist yourself along the way. Um, <laughs> but the Dental Hospital in Cork is actually 100 years old this year, and this is the equipment that I, because I've been <coughs> not one but two centuries, I'm like everybody here, you know, but um, this is the equipment that I personally trained on this, up, up at the infirmary. And that was the uh, uh, 19th and 20th century. But moving to the 21st century, we have to ask ourselves, really, as we get our students at the stage of becoming graduates, going out into the world, are, are the same teaching methods really appropriate, using the standards of interpedagogies, which was the formal lecture, uh, also small group teaching, and also structured clinical practice? Is that going to prepare them for all the multiple roles that they have to absorb and endorse and engage with? You can see we have a digital age, we have moved into, I suppose, the practice of dentistry and now is being seen as being almost the art of the aesthetic. Everybody wants perfection, it isn't just extract that tooth and be done with it, you know. So it has become, become very complex. We have four handed dentistry, six handed dentistry, we have all the other dental professions that we have to interact with. So. Uh, there was a project that I was working on actually a couple of years ago, uh, Dr. Ryan here, and this was the Clan Meds project, looking at the different roles that healthcare professionals have to uh, be able to assimilate going forward in the 21st century. And when you go to a dentist or your healthcare professional, yes, you want them to be an expert in what they, they are speaking to you about. They have to know what they're talking about. They have to do that. They have to be able to be a scholar. They have to study. They must be lifelong scholars because information is changing at a rapid, rapid pace. The information that we had about cancer 50 years ago isn't what you want to be told today if you get diagnosed. You know, they have to be able to communicate with you, explain things in a way that you can absorb. They have to be able to manage their practice, manage their time, manage their staff, manage their facilities, manage their resources. They must collaborate with other healthcare professionals. They must be able to act as an advocate on your behalf and on the behalf of the community in which they actually live and work. And they must do so in an ethical and very professional manner. So when you look at all the different attributes that we expect our students now, when they leave as graduates, to actually be able to assume, is this something that you can teach somebody within a formal lecture? Um, a lot of the research that exists to date suggests that actually we have huge, significant gaps in the curriculum, that a lot of the things that are needed for the students to learn are part of the hidden curriculum, i.e. that information you're meant to absorb, but just by being on the premises. Nobody teaches you, but you watch, you observe, you you observe how other people do things and you mimic them and you, you learn to walk the walk and talk the talk. So I think that it's time for us to move beyond the standard two pedagogies, which is the formal lecture and structured clinical practice where I see a student um, who has a patient that needs a filling, I observe them, I assist them in actually doing that filling or that uh, so in my case, extractions, because I don't bother with fillings, I just put them all out. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's a very, it, it's a very structured, uh, I suppose, kind of a false kind of a setting. You don't get the same interaction. They don't have to argue the patient, the pros and cons, will they pay for it, not pay for it, etc. So I think we have to take our students a step further. We have to have a third pedagogy, which is integrated learning. And what is that? This is a couple of different ideas of what it really means. I like the one by Frank Rhodes, uh, which is information that's assimilated. Knowledge, if it's static, if it's just in a book or just in your head, if you can't use it, it's no darn good to you. You know, if you want to go to a doctor, you want to go to a surgeon, he says, well, I can see your appendix is inflamed. I know all the steps that are required to take it out. No, I, I actually have never done it, but, you know, I actually know what I should do, theoretically. I don't think you'd be kind of rushing to sign on to him. So professional education requires more than the basic knowledge. It requires somebody who is able to engage in knowledge, but not for the sake of knowledge alone, who is able to take that knowledge, use it, bring it a step forward, and learn from it, and be able to use it in an ethical, responsible fashion. Again, you all know the Dr. Shipman case, where 
as I say, Harold Shipman was going around signing on all these lovely elderly little dears and then nice and quietly knocking them off as well, you know. So ethics is a big part of modern medicine. You know, we have a lot of ethical dilemmas uh, which we won't go into now. So in relation to integrative learning, okay, what does that mean? What do you have to have? Do you have to have somebody who can take information, who can take the experience they had last week and use it this week on a different patient in, in a new situation, being able to adapt it, who can see the connections between the information they learned when they were only a first year, when they were being taught how to examine um, an actual corpse in the anatomy department, and be able to use the information that they got from, from in relation to physiology, anatomy, biochemistry, and assimilate it and now use it in their day-to-day -day actual practice. Um, that we have to have vertical integration, horizontal integration. Vertical is from year one to year five. Horizontal is across the different subjects that they would study in each year, so that they can bring all the information together. We have to have students that can draw on all the knowledge that they've been given and from all the sources at their command, internet, library, books, journals, the staff, the patients, their peers, etc., and use all this knowledge, use all these skills. I mentioned the hidden curriculum a minute ago. This is what you absorb by being in the hospital, by being with fellow professionals. Um, it's, it's a way of behaving, a way of acting, a way of engaging, a way of, I suppose, handling patients with, with, with uh, respect and with empathy. And this is something that isn't written in, in any book. It's something you have to learn by being there. Um, they must take the knowledge and be ready to take it out of the hospital, out of the school, into the real world, and be able to use it going forward in their practices be able to think and act flexibly with it. And I think to do this, we need to introduce students to interventions that will, will let them practice these skills. Um, it, it must be a challenging one, it must be valid, it must have application to their chosen field, and must be something that they can see that makes sense to them in, in their future roles. So this is what I wrote my chapter on, and I know you'll start waiting at me if I'm out of time. Um, I use the, uh, the structure that I love best is actually, is actually teaching for understanding because I think if you can't teach for understanding, if the students don't know what they're meant to understand and if they can't understand it and take it forward and do it, then you're wasting your time. So for that, the structure that I use is up there. You have to have a generative topic, something that's important, that's engaging, that they will buy into, that has a lot of merit and is valid in the future for them as well and has multiple entry points. So for this, the actual topic that I chose was head and neck cancer, and I'll explain a little bit about that to you in a minute. Uh, it has to, you have to have overarching understanding goals, and the goals for the intervention, I'll explain to you in a second. It must foster understanding, and you must have a way of being able to demonstrate understanding, and then obviously there has to be assessment at the end of it. So I mentioned that it was head and neck cancer prevention was what I am speaking about in the chapter. This is a, if anybody knows me, they know this is a topic dear to my heart. Uh, this is the mouth cancer intervention in Brazil. It's, it's a one-day event that we run every year for the last four years. This was the crowd of people that turned up to engage and to actually participate <coughs> in this event in 2010. We stopped the traffic in Wilton Road. So what we did was we got the students to... We cancelled every other activity in the hospital. We opened the doors. We said, anybody can come. It doesn't matter whether you're an existing patient or a new patient or where you're from. We will give you a mouth cancer examination completely free with no obligation whatever. And the students were on standby waiting to do it. We had them divided up into chairs. And as the individuals came in, they were given a little form to send consent. And then the students examined them, giving them a simple examination for mouth cancer. And then after the students had finished the examination, <coughs> a staff member checked over the examination and uh, uh, to make sure nothing significant was missed. That also gave the students the opportunity to see an expert performing the examination, gave the students an opportunity to say, I found this lump, I think it's this, what do you think it is, am I right, am I wrong? And it also gave us a chance to give the students formative assessment on the spot and so that they could improve the technique and then go on to the next patient and do it again. So this is the kind of lesion side, the lights are a bit high. You, you know, the whole aim is to find lesions when they're small, when they're e either at a stage where they're precancerous or easily removed, rather than having patients present with lesions like this, which is what I normally would see for people would present with stage three, stage four cancer, where it's a very destructive and, and very devastating disease. 
So looking at the, the actual roles that we had a minute ago, if you remember the CanMed's roles, and mapping the moth cancer intervention onto those roles, you can see how it actually fits into quite a lot of them. So they have to be medical experts, they have to know their anatomy and know how to do the examination, know their, their actual oral medicine, etc. They have to be able to carry out the examination, they have to be able to come to a reasonable diagnosis. They have to act in an ethical, compassionate and considerate way. They have to collaborate with the other members of staff, be it the nurses, <coughs> the dental hygiene students, um, the secretarial staff in, in relation to booking people back in, etc., and obviously with the tutors. Um, they must be able to communicate, to explain to the patient, this is what we found, this is what we're going to do, you know, I notice that you smoke, that you drink, you know, and discuss these risk factors with them and act both as a good communicator and act as a healthcare advocate as well. They must manage their time, they must plan resources. Believe me, when you saw the queue that we had, we had 3,000 people turn up. I thought I was going to be lynched. I thought maybe 400 would show up. Um, it was like the X factor without the tent. So <laughs> I can tell you management of resources was key on my list that day. You know, so they have to interact with the team and they have to also be able to arrange appropriate referrals for those that need it going on. And they have to be scholars and they also interacted with the local professionals that were having um, excuse the lectures in relation to this day as well so the students attended those and they saw their actual future colleagues coming along and getting upskilled as well so in order to assess the educational impact of the intervention i'm not going to talk about the intervention anymore okay but i gave the students a questionnaire about a month afterwards when they had time to absorb it and we had dental hygiene students this year and we had dental excuse me, fifth year students that were finishing off their actual overall degree in dentistry and we have, uh, this is just the last year we saw 404 patients and most of the students saw at least 15 patients and a lot of them saw a lot more than that so um, I asked them if they felt it was useful and all of them felt it was very useful and in fact the vast majority felt it was extremely useful the questionnaire I gave them was mixed methodology it had some very standard questions using the Likert scale etc and it had um, the open-ended questions for the, their informed feedback as well. So I'm just presenting it very briefly. You can get the book and read it if you want to learn more. Okay. And these are the issues that they flagged, i.e. that it did actually help them to become more, more conscious, more aware of head and neck cancer and of, of, of the importance of the role that they would play in relation to prevention of this disease in the future. It gave them a sense of increased confidence. It helped them to uh, I say both uh, be able to practice their examination skills and to upskill themselves in it. It also helped them to find out where they had gaps in the knowledge, what they did not know. And as I keep telling students, I don't really want to know what you know, I want to know what you don't know. Because you won't kill anybody with what you know, it's what you don't know is where the danger comes. So I think students discovering what they don't know is really important. Um, they felt they were well supported in the event by the staff, that they weren't, it didn't make them anxious, it didn't make them feel uneasy because they were having to see this number of patients. And they really appreciate the hands on experience of having really, really busy practice because the students, when they have our structured clinical sessions, they might see one, maybe two patients in a whole uh, session, which would be three hours. You know, of practice, you go to a doctor's waiting room, it isn't going to be one or two people every three hours you'll be seeing, you know. So they have to get used to coping with large numbers and being able to efficiently and nicely get through the people and get everybody's needs met. Um, so they, they appreciated the exposure to oral medicine and etc. And it, it, it did flag for them the fact that their future role would be multifaceted, you know, that they had to be sensitive, that they had to have a holistic approach to patient care. This is some of the feedback there, and you can read fast that I can talk. So um, I like this one here. It was one of the most beneficial learning days of the entire dental course. You know, that to me was nice. <laughs> um, so looking towards the future, okay, I asked them for what we could do better, what we could change. The students noted lots of things that they would like us to change. However, I have question marks there because I'm allowed to have this one day intervention as long as I don't interfere with the overall running of the hospital, as long as I don't incur a cost to the hospital. So I have lots of restrictions on me. And when you read about integrated learning, you will, you will find that people note this fact that when you step outside the box and you want to introduce the students to other ways of learning, you know, you can come up against obstacles in relation to, well, that isn't the way we always did it. You are paid to give a lecture. 
we have the financial resources for you to give a lecture. We don't have the financial resources for you to have 400 pairs of gloves used and 400 masks and 400 wipe downs used. You know, so these are just the issues. So the students would like more access to lesions of interest than I can definitely do. What we'll do is actually photograph the lesions of interest and hopefully fit in a lecture where I can give them all an opportunity to see the lesions and discuss them. They'd like the staff, uh, the staff student ratio to be, so that we know, and the staff student ratio should be increased. Yes, but I can't because we're already at the maximum on the staff that UCC will pay for. Um, the student patio ratio, they'd like to have less students around a patient. However, if I do that by splitting the groups in half, then the students will only see half the patient. They're going to have, I uh, say, yes, there'll be less people around every single patient, but the students will see less. So there's a good and a bad side of things. They'd like to have more clinical space, so would I. You know, um, <laughs> uh, so looking forward, I think that what I've learned from it is that we can use our experiences, the things that we've tried and tested, to encourage others to step outside their normal box and to develop opportunities for where the students can have a real, a, I suppose, kind of an actual real setting where it will really resemble normal life. Um, it can be challenging, it does require a huge investment of time, energy, and resources. And it, it has to be tackled rather creatively. Uh, but I think that the actual student feedback would suggest that if you go beyond the normal academic boundaries, the feedback is, is extremely good and it, it will pay handsome dividends. So I'll just finish with these two quotes. I think that if you want to, if you want to predict the future, our probably best way is to help it along by creating it ourselves. And what are we doing in our roles as educationists if we're not actually trying to make our students understand more deeply, expand their minds and strengthen their characters and make them into really integrated individuals going forward. And thank you.